probably noticed, we have some special guests with us here today as well. Uh, I'd be happy to facilitate interviews with them following the formal portion this morning. Those are Senator Perry and Representatives Burroughs and Brulo, as well as Regent Griffin and Student Regent Lewis. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ted Mitchell. I'm the president of the Health Sciences Center here at Tech and Chancellor of the System. We are here today because Governor Abbott this past weekend uh, signed all of the, the, the last of the legislative uh, appropriations that were sent to him by uh, the 86th legislature. And in that, uh, we have had an absolutely historic uh, legislative session for the Texas Tech University System, and I would say for uh, all of West Texas and actually even beyond that. This has been for us uh, a long, long road, uh, but it's been very much worth the effort that everybody has put into it. First and foremost, we want to thank the governor uh, for the support that he's shown, not just for the Texas Tech University system, but for higher education in general. Uh, we also want to thank the legislature for the work they did and in particular, the, the folks that are here that are our legislative uh, delegation that have they've done from the very beginning of this thing and I don't mean back in January I mean going all the way back for the last few years they've been working on our uh, initiatives in an exceptionally hard time in an exceptionally great fashion for us so they've done the, the, the yeoman's work and making sure that our agendas stayed at the forefront of everybody's thinking and that they were able to take this thing through uh, the session and help shepherd it through the entire time. So there's been a lot of work done uh, on the, the governmental side. It's really important for folks to remember that if you look at the, uh, if you look at the state budget, there's a large part of the budget that is locked up. It's locked up in the health care that we deliver through Medicaid, it's locked up in K through 12 through public education, through things that are extraordinarily important that just from the get go when you come out of the chute, you're already looking at the majority of the budget for just those areas. So when we go down and talk about things related to higher education, of course, all of us and universities and colleges will go down and talk about the importance of higher education, but we do that realizing that there are a number of people down there that have really important priorities that they're all trying to get through. And what happens is, as these pieces of legislation are, are advanced, in order for certain pieces of legislation to work, that means other pieces of legislation, really good legislation, never make it. And so the fact that we've had our initiatives work uh, all the way through the session, that we've always been able to uh, play defense by keeping them, keeping them in there and keeping them in the budget, it has been an extraordinarily successful session for us. When I say it's historic, I don't mean that flippantly and I don't mean that uh, lightly. This to me is the most historic session we've had in the last 50 years. 50 years ago in 1969, the 61st legislative session, that was the session where we were, we were changed from Texas Technological College to Texas Tech University. And it was also during that same session that the School of Medicine was formed. And I believe that this is the most uh, important and historic session we've had since that time. Uh, we have been able to add two new professional schools uh, to the Texas Tech University system with the School of Dental Medicine at HSC El Paso and with the School of Veterinary Medicine uh, here in Lubbock. And we've also achieved significant uh, successes for the Health Sciences Center here in Lubbock with the Texas Tech Mental Health Institute funding and with Angelo State University with additional funding they had for student success. So overall for our system, this has been an outstanding session. One of the things that's really important for all of us to do, everybody sitting in this room, everybody that cares about West Texas, about Lubbock, uh, about higher education, about the Texas Tech system, one of the things that is incumbent upon us to do is to help the folks in Austin remember that even though we only make up 13% of the population out here in West Texas, uh, we're now approaching close to 30 million people, only 13% of folks live west of I-35, but that 13% of the population is responsible for driving the state's economy. The two largest areas that drive the Texas economy are agriculture and energy, both of which are housed out here in West Texas. And one of the things that we have to do is help remind our friends in East Texas that it's important for us to take care of the people of the state who take care of us. 
So if you look at the, the vet school initiative that Dr. Scuban is gonna talk about in just a minute, it made absolute sense for this to be seated in Amarillo, Texas, which is the epicenter of the nation's beef industry. Uh, if you look at what we do here on the, the southern end of the South Plains uh, with cotton production, this is a critical industry, not just for this region, not just for the state, but for the nation. And if you go down to the Permian Basin, where oil and gas are produced, this is, a, this is something that is obviously important, not just for us, but, but in fact, not just for the country, but for folks around the globe. So it's the West Texans that provide the food, fiber, and fuel for the entire nation. And one of our jobs throughout this, this session is to make sure that people understood that uh, while we were down there. We took a different approach to session this time. We actually had various teams of folks that were working in a very positive, very upbeat way to make sure that we, we stayed out in front of the issues that people were bringing up because with all the competing ideas that were going on in Austin for various types of legislation, it was important that we made sure that our voice was heard. And so we had, uh, we had regents, we had former regents, we had foundation board members, former foundation board members, we had uh, uh, councils of government representing different regions of the state. Uh, we had all of our presidents from the universities. We had former chancellors working with us. We had alumni working with us. We had uh, chambers of commerce from all over the state in general, West Texas in particular. We had industry folks working with us. We had just a number of people that were constantly working in addition to the work being done by our internal team uh, that has been always a phenomenal part of what we've been able to do in Austin. And the incredible thing about that is uh, you know, Lawrence and I get to sit up here and talk about all the, the great things that happen when the fact of the matter is the people that were really making it happen are, are folks that never wind up in front of mics. When I started at the Health Sciences Center a long time ago, many years ago, I came in the office early one morning and the phone rang. I'm the first one there, answered the phone, thinking you can help. Hello. Uh, the fellow on the phone asked a specific question that I did not know the answer to and I said, look, uh, okay, I don't, I'm not sure what you need, but you know, I can find somebody who can help you. And he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm actually the president of the university. There's this long pause. He said, okay, look, I'm just gonna call back later because I need to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> so there's a lot of credit that goes to people that are never in front of the cameras. This was truly a team effort with everything that we've done. Uh, we had tremendous help uh, by our elected officials in this region, but this is something where our focus was basically two things making sure that we got service to people in this region that need service and making sure that we could provide affordable education, higher education, to citizens of the state of Texas in areas where currently uh, there are not options for them. So those were our two big drives behind all of this. Mm -hmm. So just very briefly, I had mentioned the, the dental school at the Health Sciences Center in El Paso. Uh, Dr. Skubanek will talk about the, the veterinary medical school that will be housed in, in Amarillo. We also had the Texas Tech Mental Health Institute, and I, I know that, that most of you will know this, but one of the areas where we've developed uh, kind of a niche on the Health Sciences Center side is with child and adolescent uh, psychiatry and mental and behavioral health. Uh, we've had a program that, that focuses on the use of telemedicine for screening students that may be at high risk for causing harm to themselves or other folks. That program has worked out very well, and uh, the, the legislature, in conjunction with the governor's office and lieutenant governor, gave us funding to continue that program and, in fact, to do things to help to expand it to other areas of the state. It's very, very important. Uh, at Angelo State University, at, at, when I was talking about their, their student enhancement, it's really important for people out here to understand what a jewel we have down in San Angelo. Angelo State University is consistently ranked by Princeton University as one of the top regional universities in the country. Uh, they have wonderful programs for students, many of whom are first generation, that were it not for the programs available to them at Angelo State, they likely would not go to college at all. And they need the additional funding. Uh, when we're down there having conversations about things that are, that are uh, big and exciting like dental schools and vet schools, there's a tendency not to pay attention to things like this where people are just doing great work quietly on their own all the time that really and truly focus on the overall economic and overall health of the, the state of Texas for the citizens that are here. And so they've done great work and, and we, were able to, um, we were able to help them with, with their mission down there. 
the, the uh, legislature increased higher education spending by 6% statewide. And if you look at, for the Texas Tech University system, uh, we uh, were able to uh, participate in that. We had an increase of our overall budget of our components of 57 million, which is 6% of an increase for us. So we were able to benefit from the focus that the legislature placed on higher education. And for that, not only are we thankful, but we think that the state's made a tremendous investment uh, into not only our region and not only in uh, higher education, but a huge investment in the future of Texas overall. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Skubanek and let him talk about the vet school. Thank you, Chancellor Mitchell. Um, as the Chancellor has said, this was a historic session. And for Texas Tech University, that is primarily because of the budget bill the governor signed last Saturday that provided our full funding request to, to begin to move forward with the School of Veterinary Medicine, along with the language that allows us to do that. And I think when you get to a moment like this, Rather than to look back at the path and count all the challenges we overcome, overcame, it's more in the spirit of West Texas to take an opportunity like this to say thank you to so many people that helped us to get to that point. And so I'm glad today that we have so many important supporters here, and I'll be acknowledging them a bit later. Uh, the vet school really did grow out of a vision and, and it, that was inspired to provide greater opportunities for students in the state of Texas and to serve an industry that is so critical to the entire state but is so centrally located in this part of our state. And so this is a great opportunity for Texas Tech to serve the needs and citizens of this state. It was also a great example of communities coming together. It's, uh, Amarillo was an extraordinary supporter but also Lubbock. Uh, the Lubbock Chamber of Commerce joined with Amarillo Matters to support this cause. I also want to acknowledge the support of the city who, who were many of the members of the council and the citizens were there on Lubbock Day when we um, made our case to our legislators. There are many people I want to thank. Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, Speaker Bonham, we appreciate their leadership but I'm especially grateful to the members of the Lubbock delegation that are here today. Senator Charles Perry, Dustin Burroughs, and John Frulo. Um, for those of you who've been in Austin and have watched these gentlemen um, operate, they are tenacious, uh, they provide extraordinary <coughs> leadership, but they do it in a way that we can be proud of. We could not be better represented than we are by these three gentlemen, and we are so grateful to their critical support that helped us to get to where we are today. Um, other members of the West Texas delegation were also very important. I want to acknowledge John Smithy for a price, Senator Seliger, and Representative King. The support of our Board of Regents was essential to getting this done. Uh, Regent Griffin, thank you for being here, and uh, Regent Lewis, our new student regent appreciate your leadership as a SGA president over the years and look forward to working with you. Um, I also want to ex express uh, what a pleasure it was to work together with President Rick Lang and Brian May, uh, along with uh, Chancellor Mitchell in Austin. We shared an apartment. Um, <laughs> I think we're all a bit too old to have roommates, <laughs> but it speaks to our presence there and, I, and especially in the case of Chancellor Mitchell, I think his leadership qualities are obvious to the public that see him. But uh, we had the opportunity to work with him hand in hand. And I think we all recognized that he had the special skills and personal traits that were so critical during this session and during the last few months. <clears throat> um, I would like to say a few things about uh, the session as it relates to Texas Tech. The chancellor mentioned the general increase for higher ed, and in particular, the general revenue. So for Texas Tech University, we'll see about a $25 million increase in overall support from the state over the biennium. That includes non-formula funding of an additional $13 million for the School of Veterinary Medicine. For, the, for this biennium, we'll have at our disposal 
17 million to move forward with the hiring of faculty. We'll need to hire 32 faculty in the next two years. We're proceeding with the plans for establishing the teaching facility there, and that's well underway. <clears throat> uh, we also saw an increase in our general revenue of about 6%, um, and that is related to a, a number of uh, issues. I want to say thank you to the state for funding the increase in enrollment in the basic formula. Uh, tech will benefit from that. Uh, the state also restored uh, an increased funding for the core research fund. Texas Tech will benefit from that through our increase in research expenditures, just as we uh, benefit from uh, the formula by their support of enrollment growth, but our growth as well. Um, we'll also receive $10 million through the trip, and we, that's a reflection of the support of many donors who support Texas Tech. And uh, uh, so in general, um, we couldn't be more pleased and more grateful for the support we're going to see in the coming biennium. And I think when you look around the country, we can say that, our, that, that Texas supports higher ed as well as K-12, through and that's attributed again to the leadership that we have. Um, so I, I want to close by just making the comment that um, as West Texans, we're very humble by nature, but we can be very proud of what we have achieved in this session. I think that generations will benefit from the transformational leadership that has been exhibited by so many people, people in the community, people in Austin, people in the, in the university, in the Texas Tech University system. I think we're excited, we're invigorated, we're enthused by the opportunity to move forward with the establishment of the Texas Tech University School of Veterinary Medicine. And again, in the spirit of West Texas, we're going to continue to seek out all the collaborations and all the cooperation that will make that a, a tremendously successful and impactful endeavor. So with that, we are open to questions, as long as they're nice questions. Yes, sir. Matt, what's your favorite color? Okay, good. All right, just checking. I believe it does, and again, I think that is, is in large part due to the, the delegation that we have, but I also think that one of the things that is critically important for people to remember is that West Texas, while our population is increasing, we are being outpaced significantly by the cities in the eastern part of the state. And so the percentage of our population as part of the whole is, is getting lower. And the days of people, uh, communities, kind of just going it on their own and trying to slug it out on their own for themselves, I think those days are done. I think that we have got to always work together. And I think that with the footprint that we have, uh, we're in a very good position to do that. Because keep in mind that Texas Tech has a presence in a lot of communities that are not what you would call Texas Tech towns necessarily. And so it's not about uh, uh, cheering for football teams and stuff like that, although that's all fun. It really is about saying, what are the needs of this community? How can they best be served? And who is in the best position to serve those needs? This state is absolutely blessed in the institutions that we have all over the state. Uh, but when it comes to West Texas, it's not that there's some nefarious plot by people elsewhere about West Texas. It's just that we're typically not on folks' radar. And so I think one of the things that we always have to work against, and Lawrence said this, West Texans by nature are pretty humble. They just do the work, no braggadocia, just do their thing. Part of our job is to toot the horn. Part of our job is to raise the flag and say, folks, you need to understand the importance of what's going on out there in these areas. Uh, and we're in a great position to be able to do that. Um, Matt. When you speak of the footprint <clears throat> of Texas Tech and West Texas, uh, that's very important. In fact, many of the things we do, 
begin with issues that start here, whether we're talking about agriculture, energy, uh, but those issues have statewide, national, and global implications. And it's really, I think, wonderful that Texas Tech is in a position, I mean the Texas Tech University system, to be doing the kind of work, providing the kind of education um, that has an effect way beyond West Texas. And if you just look at our enrollment, uh, we would not have 38,000 students if we just recruited from Amarillo to El Paso. And I think that speaks to the quality of the education you get here, our brand. And um, as I travel around the country, uh, I was in Chicago and D.C. last week. In both meetings I went to, somebody, a president at another university, mentioned they knew that we were engaged in a discussion to get a school of veterinary medicine. And, and they were impressed by that. Um, I think they were also impressed that we got to the Final Four in basketball. <laughs> and that we were in the World Series. Uh, but um, we're, our roots are in West Texas, but our impact goes way beyond it. Hey, can either of you talk a bit more about what's next for the vet, vet school? Um, I believe it has to go to the Texas Higher Education Board next. Sure. And no, the, the Higher Education Coordinating Board, they've got a job to do to make sure that the, the degree that we would be granting is a degree that the state needs. And so there's a whole series of things that you have to go through with the Coordinating Board. We've had great discussions uh, with staff members at the Coordinating Board as well as the members themselves. And our proposal, which was put in back in February, has now been sent out to an outside reviewer. They'll take a look at it, send it back with their recommendations. There'll be then a, a site visit with coordinating board members that come out here. It's the next step in the process. Uh, but it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 with this because part of what they need at the coordinating board is to know that the state's giving you the funding. And part of the funding from the state is to know that the coordinating board is going to support the degree program. So we've cleared a, a huge hurdle. And by having the House and the Senate and the governor's office all support this, it really helps what it is we're trying to do and make our case. I'm sure the coordinating board is just going to proceed in a very professional way to do their job, but it was a tremendous help um, to see that House and the Senate funded, provided our full funding request. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite color? Okay. Um, so uh, we've been engaged in planning for the facility for quite some time. That's what the first biennium provided us, the opportunity to do that. Um, Dr. Lana Reagan uh, has been instrumental in leading the original organization of the, uh, of the, the, what would be part of the vet school. We've already had a preliminary visit from the American Veterans Medical Association and uh, so we'll be moving forward with the accreditation issues, with the hiring of faculty, the development of the curriculum, and the facilities. And that's ongoing now, and it will intensify the funding that we have. So we'll have a groundbreaking in September, and we expect to have our first students in by the fall of 21. So kind of now moving forward, what are some challenges you foresee for these kind of new students? Well, I think it's going to be a challenge to hire uh, that many veterinarians be part of the faculty that will be that's going to take a concerted effort we've already talked about enhancing the sport and, and uh, our HR office to make sure we get that done uh, and I think also um, getting that facility built for the 90 million that has been committed uh, will take some very good planning but overall if you look at the challenges we've had challenges every step along the way and there is nothing worth having that's not worth working for and we've cleared major hurdles just in the last few days, and we are uh, excited. There's nothing out here that West Texas folks can't do, and we will do. So what's the total budget for this project, and then where's the, where's the other funding coming from? So we were provided $17.3 million in this biennium to do the things I just mentioned, the hiring of faculty, sitting with the facilities and such. That's for this biennium. Uh, we won't start to generate formula until after that first class enrolls in 2021, and even then it's going to be uh, a year or so down the road. So it's this kind of support from the state that allows us to 
jumpstart this whole initiative, and that eventually it will uh, exist on its own resources, and it is formula and tuition. So Ted mentioned that statewide, I think th 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 there was about a 6% increase for higher ed. That includes both formula and non-formula money, and that's where Texas Tech li uh, fell in line. Um, the, um, you asked, well, are we going to decrease tuition? No. Uh, and I don't mean to be flippant in saying that, but that's uh, what you have to things are not getting uh, less expensive. I think uh, the support like this enable us, enables us to control the rate of increase, and we're very sensitive to that. We pay a lot of attention looking at debt. And that's a big priority here, is to make sure our students are graduating with less debt all the time. And so this enables us to be very conservative in what we may have to charge. Uh, if you look at the formula, there was a slight increase in the base rate appreciative of that, but it's still below the pre-recession levels. And when you take into account the, the uh, inflation rate, these are, these are things we have to deal with and the challenges uh, that would make it very difficult to do something like decreased tuition. On the other hand, um, Texas Tech has provided a tremendous increase in scholarship over the last few years. That's one way you offset tuition cost. And in fact, our discount rate is approaching 30%. So if you look at the advertised price and what a student really pays, those, um, the discount rate, rate reflects our support of those students. And Matt, if I, let me put on my health sciences center hat for just a minute. One of the things that we focus on, when you, when you talk about tuition and fees with students, one of the things, and this is a statewide thing, and actually, you know, it's a national conversation, but the real focus is on student debt, and not to get to, where's uh, Byron Kennedy? Not to get too granular, using Byron's language about this, uh, but this is a multi-layered thing. So, for example, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the credit that students are getting in high school, that they're using for college. If you look at the junior colleges and the hours that the, the students are taking there before they transfer to a four-year school. If you look at students once they get to a four-year school that are given opportunities for taking out credit in certain areas, all of those things add up. And so one of the things that the legislature looks at very carefully, that the, the speaker looks at, the lieutenant governor, the governor, they look to see, okay, what's happening in those steps that are adding to unnecessary debt for those students. And that is a, a conversation that we have internally all the time. Uh, and that conversation can be uh, at a statewide level saying we've got to make sure that if students are taking courses at a junior college, not only will they transfer, but they will transfer toward the degree that they're seeking so that you don't get these kids wind up graduating from their four year with an additional 20 or 30 hours that they couldn't use. That's one conversation. Internally, we'll have conversations even down into the weeds enough to say, okay, if student Regent Lewis as a 1L starting in our law school, he's gonna receive all kinds of applications for credit cards coming to him because of the school that he's now in. One of the things that's coming upon us as his father figure in the school is say, listen, just because you're eligible for certain credit and debt, don't take it. So there's a lot of things that go on internally within a university, uh, within a system, about helping these students understand the need to minimize their debt along the way. Uh, that, that we, and this is not just us, this is within systems around the state, to make sure that we're doing what we can to minimize it. From the Health Sciences Center perspective, we love to talk about the fact that we are one of the least expensive medical schools in the United States. And, and on the Health Science Center side, the, the medical schools are where we have most of the detailed data on things, so it's, the, it's kind of the bellwether for the other programs in the Health Sciences Center. But we talk about that a lot, that we're one of the least expensive medical schools in the country. Now for us, 
Simultaneously, we're ranked above the 90th percentile for educational quality. We think that's a really good return on investment. Now, truth be told, if you look at the, the top 10 least expensive medical schools in the United States, six of them are from the state of Texas. So the state does do a good job on the HRI side, the health related institution side, of trying to keep the cost down by investing in it. But the, 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 real, the real issue is student debt. What are we letting them graduate with? How far back are they away from the starting line when they receive their diploma before they can even catch up? So there's a bunch of things in there that, that all of us, you know, the, the, the room of everybody thinking about it is a whole lot better than any one individual. But at the end of the day, it's about the student debt load that we're leaving them with. And that's something we work on internally as well as we work on across the state. And um, seeing reason. Griffin sitting there reminds me of another aspect of this conversation. Our board um, is very concerned about what we charge, the value that students get. So typically, um, when we go to the board with any tuition increases, um, they want to know what is the higher education price index rate? What is the consumer price index? We look at that kind of data, and I doubt that the board would ever allow us to increase our rate at anything greater than those. One last comment, Ted alluded to this and the value that you get at uh, HSC, <coughs> but I think we need to change the conversation um, about rankings. Uh, if, if you look at something like U.S. News and Real Report, schools that, that charge a lot and spend a lot do well. If your mission is to be inclusive and be cost effective, it hurts you in certain aspects of that ranking. On the other hand, if you look at something like Forbes, best value colleges. They rank 300 schools in the United States. Only 300. Out of how many? Well, there's about 3,000 baccalaureate institutions. That's important information to give them when you're doing that. <laughs> well, um, they've done this for four years. We were not ranked the first year. 298, 138, now 116. Tech has moved up to 116th in the nation. On ret that reflects return on investment. So in spite of the cost and our concern about debt, tech is a great value. That's more than you asked for. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, you all were in El Paso yesterday. I Correct. Was in Amarillo later today. Is this kind of, how would you describe this? Is this like a victory tour, maybe? <laughs> I would never categorize it that way. <laughs> that reminds me of a story. I told this story to our 50th anniversary guest the other night. So there's this old boy from Demet. He's driving over in Dallas. And you know the folks sometimes in DFW, they don't understand us folks out in rural areas. So there's a particular policeman that had something against him. He sees a Demet bumper sticker on there. He pulls this fellow over. And he starts giving him all kinds of grief about being from a small town. Saying, you small town folks, you just don't understand the big city like we do. And we don't allow people to speed around here. And I'm going to have to write you up. So it's a hot summer day. Uh, flies are buzzing around this police officer. He's writing a ticket. And uh, the fellow from Demet says, Officer, are, are them circle flies bothering you? He says, yeah, they are. He says, why don't you call them circle flies? He said, well, those flies, they like to circle around the back end of a horse. Officer looked at him and said, are you calling me at the back end of a horse? He said, no, sir, I would never do that. I got too much respect for the police department to do that. Of course, it's hard to fool them circle flies. <laughs> no, this, 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 for us, this is a way for us to go back to the communities, to the communities that made these initiatives happen and say, thank you. And, and, and it's to point out to them what West Texas can do when West Texans work together. And if you look at the list of chambers of commerce, if you look at the councils of government collectively in the region that were supporting these efforts, it's very impressive. And in contrast to what was going on in 1969 with the School of Medicine, when you had Lubbock and Amarillo and El Paso fighting vociferously against one another over who was going to get the school, it was really, it was really a mess back then to see the infighting that was going on about the School of Medicine. And it is in such contrast 
to how this worked this go round, where you've got chambers of commerce that seemingly would have nothing to do with one another, all banding together to make this thing happen. So this tour that we're doing is to really thank the folks collectively for the work they did. And we might get a little victory lap too. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.